Hi, I'm Willie. Welcome to my channel. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time here or you're a long time viewer, uh, subscriber, uh, thank you very much. I do appreciate each and every one of you. If you need IT consulting, go to WillieHow.com, fill out the contact form and someone will be in touch with you as soon as possible. What we're talking about today is the TP-Link uh, multi-WAN WAN router. So this router, this is an Omada router. It can be standalone or it can be in the Omada controller. So let's take a look. Here is our login page. So we're going to log in as admin and I've already changed the password. And a lot of this information that you're going to see here, you can do this in the Omada controller, right? So it's, it's nice that what they provide here is also provided in the controller, but you don't have to you don't have to use the controller, right? So this is the TR or the TL-R605. It is a safe stream gigabit multi-WAN VPN router. So I did update the firmware on this and TP-Link did send this to me, but they do not get to preview these videos and they do not get to alter my opinions in any way. As we work through these, my opinion is my opinion. You can see that it's going out. It's using NTP to automatically uh, pull the, the time and date. You can see it's been eight days since I rebooted it last. We've got a dynamic IP. And then right here, we've got some CPU and memory utilization. Then under traffic stats, we can, we can come over here and we can take a look at the LAN, WAN. Now we can have up to, uh, I think three or four WANs on this. I'm, it's either three or four, but you can see here that it looks like we can have four WANs and uh, or we can have one WAN, four LANs. So there's a few different ways to configure this, which is nice. You can see we've got uh, total total traffic under network set up. Here's where we can take a look at configuring the WANs and the LANs. So if I keep checking these boxes, now I've got one LAN, I've got four WANs. And let me save this. Let me turn those back on. Not that we're actually gonna have those. We could set that up, it'd be interesting. So it's processing, please do not operate the device. I don't know how long it takes to save this. I haven't enabled all four WANs and click that save button. All right, so we are rebooted. So we'll log back in after entering our super secret credentials. So now you can see that I've got four WAN connections and uh, maybe I'll just hook them up and we'll see how that works out for us. But let's go back over to network and WAN. And so now WAN one, uh, WAN, uh, WAN, WAN, and WAN. <laughs> I keep looking over at LAN and I want to say that, but um, these all show up and we can select a different type of um, a, a different type of connection for getting our IP address. One thing that I'm wondering, and I don't know, is if I could actually have, like if I had a block of five IPs, I'm, I'm going to try this and we're going to see if it works, but could I use all four connections um, off of the same net block. My gut says no, but I, you know, my gut says no, but why not try it, right? It's a lab. Worst we're gonna do is crash the lab or it's not gonna work. Um, so on our uh, WAN connection here, um, we can set a host name. We can also change our upstream and downstream bandwidth, change our MTU if we need to, change our primary, secondary, DNS or put it on a VLAN and we can also get our IP address using a unicast DHCP. So that's pretty nifty. Four LAN ports provide you a lot of options for failover. Um, it also provides you a lot of options for policy based routing. All right, so over to our LAN section here. You can see we are at 192.168.0.1. So had we not selected those interfaces as WAN interfaces, they will be LAN interfaces. Here are our DHCP server options. So you can see some of the more popular options are built out in the UI so that we can fill those in here. Here's our DHCP client list. We can add address reservations on this screen. So this is nice. Here's uh, MAC addresses. So what's really nice is you can clone uh, the MAC address is right here in the UI. No special files needed or anything like that. And then here's that switch setup that I was talking about. So you can do your port configuration, change the flow control, negotiation mode, 
We've got our port status here so you can see that only our WAN and our LAN are up right now. But yes, we can do port mirroring ingress egress in the hardware of the router. And then here's where we set up our VLAN ID so you can see that uh, there are some VLANs set up already. And you can see that um, VLAN 1 is untagged on LAN 1. So this must use uh, internal VLAN, so we'll dig into that a little bit more. And then here are our ports. Yeah, you can see the PVID on these. So can I, uh, because they're WAN, these are set up as WAN, that's probably why it does that. So if, if you've seen this in other devices, that is, it's probably a similar a similar concept. So we're going to have to look into that. So it attached, it actually created these um, untagged VLANs for the WAN. Under preferences, we can set up those IP groups and IP addresses. So we can use these as uh, aliases throughout the system. You can set up your time ranges, set up our VPN IP pool, and then um, we can come in here and add services based on ports so we can define that. So that's pretty nice. That'll probably come into play when we're looking at ACLs and things like that. So under transmission, we can look at NAT. So we can do a one-to-one -one NAT. And if we add a one-to-one -one NAT, uh, we can select the uh, interface, the original IP, translated IP. So this is where I wanna know, can I have you know, all of those IP addresses in the same network on the WAN and then use that here for one-to-one -one NAT. Of course, we've got virtual servers with port forwarding. If you've worked with any kind of router, you're familiar with that. Your port triggering, uh, port triggering is kind of like uh, port knocking where you hit one port and then it opens another port. Here's our NAT DMZ and then here's our ALGs and they are all enabled by default. So um, we are going to disable these because we know that uh, sometimes ALGs cause more problems than they solve. Under bandwidth control, we can enable bandwidth control when bandwidth re uh, usage reaches a percentage. That's nice. Um, we can come down here and we can add different rules. So you can see here's those IP groups that we had earlier. Um, and we can tell it that it's got a maximum upstream, downstream, and you can do it shared or individual, and you can set time limits on it. So that's really nice. We're gonna get into that a little bit. We've got session limits here. So we can say that IP addresses can only have so many sessions going through the firewall. And then you've got your session monitor there. Here's that load balancing. So by default, it is enabled. So I'm not sure what really happens when we disable that. Um, it says the WAN port traffic. And we're gonna, we're gonna have to dig into this. And then we can do bandwidth based on routing ports, which is nice. We've got our link backup. So primary WAN, we can set the primary WAN and we can set a backup WAN. And it looks like we can do that multiple times. I'm not 100% sure, we'll try that out. And then this is how we detect if, a, if an interface is online. Then under routing, here's our static routes. That's pretty, pretty standard, but check this out. Here's our policy-based routing. So if we wanted to send FTP traffic or SSH traffic out of a specified WAN, once we have Oh, see, so SSH and FTP are already predefined, but we could predefine, um, we could predefine like Synology traffic, right? So if it was destined for port 5001, send it out of this WAN. So you can do all of that here. You can also do it by IP, right? So if you've got a connection to AWS or something like that, and you always wanted to go out of the same WAN, you put your target IP in there and then it always goes out of the WAN. So you can do it based on service and you could do it based on IP, probably a combination of the both, and you can actually make it so it has time constraints. So this is really flexible for that. Under firewall, we've got some basic things like anti-ARP spoofing, um, which is nice. We'd have to see exactly how that works out for us. You've got some light attack defense. This, this is probably defined on static rules, so it's not gonna be something that can dynamic be dynamic and change a lot based on, you know, we've got some other services um, with with uh, firewalls that are much more expensive that they can adapt to the traffic. And then here are ACLs. So if we add an ACL, you can see we've got a block or allow policy. What service do we want to block? What interface do we want to block it on? What source? 
this is pretty this is way more flexible than some of the other routers that we have in this price range behavior control so we can do some uh, web filtering we can do it by group we can also do url filtering so now of course the router is going to have to handle your dns for that then we've got web security so what's our web security list down here block http post we can block file suffixes from coming through that's cool we we'll have to see how that works with something going over https then here is our vpn setup we've got ipsec and then here's our security associations so we can see when things are online let's see if we can do um, let's see so we got land to land client to land let's look at our advanced settings so we can get into the nitty-gritty right here in the ui and uh, work on phase one settings or phase two settings, which is fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic to be able to have that breakdown. What they've done is they've really exposed a lot of the options under the hood in the UI, and I love it. All right, you've got your L2TP, which you know we basically use for client config, PPTP, which should not be in any router at this point, and then we've got our user set up here. So... Um, we own oh, we can specify whether it's l2tp or pptp so that's kind of nice authentication settings um, of course we would have to enable authentication this is probably looks like this is for uh, a portal so we'll get into that user management and somewhere i think we can tie this to active directory or some other ldap server so I'm, we'll have to dig into that as well then one thing that they really need to update is they need to add a custom dynamic DNS instead of just limiting us to these four because a lot of us use Google and other services. Here's universal plug and play, which occasionally we run, but not very often. Then under system tools, we've got uh, admin setup. You can limit the remote management of the device here under remote management system settings where we can redirect to HTTPS. Right now you can see it's just HTTP. Then under management, we can do a factory restore, a backup or a restore, a reboot, firmware upgrade. Here we can bind it to the Omada controller under controller settings. We can enable SNMP. Doesn't look like, this looks like it's probably version one if I had to guess, because there's no authentication here. Um, we've got some light diagnostics, ping, trace route, remote assistance, which is nice. I'm going to have to dig in to see how that works. I'm assuming that's for TP link. We've got time settings so we can change our time zone, our NTP server, and then we've got our system log here. So for a device that is, uh, inexpensive, I think this device is less than a hundred bucks. Um, I'll leave an affiliate link down below. It's got some great features. So we're really going to dig into this. Um, and out of the box experience, you can literally plug and play, plug it in and go. No other configuration needed, but you should change your default username and password. So um, overall, it's going to be something we're going to add to the lab and we are going to start doing some of those shorter uh, in the weeds videos on this. So if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Please comment and share. Please follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Those links are down below. If you need IT consulting, go to willyhow.com, fill out the contact form, and someone will be in touch with you as soon as possible. If you want to support the channel by using our affiliate links, they are down below. They don't change your price, but they do kick a couple bucks to the channel. Once again, I'm Willie. I want to thank you for being here. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.